Lots of people have got a negative view of social media. I used to have it, particularly having children, teenage children. I thought there was a lot of negative and a lot of harm that could be done until three years ago when I started working within the social media world. And I probably wouldn't be here without it. You know, so my views changed. I admitted that I was wrong as long as we use it sort of correctly. And I've met people like Sue as a result. And we share a passion for parenting, particularly reading and so if anybody doesn't know, um, is an author. She's wrote quite a few books on parenting. She is a parenting expert. You've probably seen her on television. That's where I first seen her on this morning. But yeah, I won't give away too much of her. We're we'll going to further our passion on to Sue. She's going to talk about the importance of reading and storytelling with children. Thanks, Sue. Okay. Well, okay. Let me fire away. I, I tell you what I brought today. I, I found this on the cupboard, you know, just over there. That's my dad. And I just thought it'd be really rather nice to have him amongst us tonight because he was a fantastic storyteller and he used to make up stories as well as read to me. And then he read to my kids and my son's a journalist now. My daughter works in kind of publishing and stuff like that because he, he ended up telling what he called true lies because he'd run out of true stories about his own life. And he made up stories that I discovered later on in life. Actually, Capon, this wonderful storytelling story around this guy was actually based on bird seed that he'd seen <laughs> in the shop. But who knew and who cared? So storytelling, reading is just so wonderful. So, of course, we all know that reading matters. I'm a former deputy head and class teacher for over 22 years. So, of course, reading is important to me. But we don't always think about how important it can be to find and carve just that 5, 10, 15 minutes regularly to read with our children. And I often found when I was teaching that parents stopped reading with them or to them around about nine. And that was a shame because you can really bond with your kids over reading a story, whether they're toddlers, not so much if they're teenagers, but if they're reading something that you've read, if it's a crime thriller or whatever it might be, or even if you just go over and say, oh, what are you interested in that for? Why? Tell me about it. Why do you like it? Then you're connecting. Life is all about connections and relationships. And being a dad is important in finding some time sometimes because um, we know there's been lots of research that reading isn't just about literacy and passing those dreaded tests. It's far more than that. Reading changes the way our brains work and how we relate to it and how we communicate with other people and how we understand the world. And there's loads of emotional benefits to that. There's educational, there's cognitive, there is neurological, there's psychological. I could go on and on. But Research also has shown that dads tend to read less to their children than mums do. Now, that's obviously perhaps because they're out and about at work during the day. But in the early years and in schools, that's quite well known. And they're quite aware of that and trying to include dads in that role of reading with their kids because you are role models in everything that you do everything you say and you are role models in reading so it's great if they see you picking up the paper or if you're reading a book it doesn't really matter what you're reading but you're sort of showing kids that literacy and reading is important and fathers who get involved in their children's reading and storytelling and you know playing around with them with rhymes and singing all of these things bond you together and make memories, of course, that last a lifetime, but it also has an impact on their attainment, their attainment and their future aspirations in life because they become more confident. And, you know, there are lots of reliable studies, I'm just looking down here, associated with the outcomes and the benefits of dads in particular reading to their children and boys, of course, in particular too. So I'll run through a few of them. I won't be too boring, hopefully, about it, but it has a really significant impact on your child's language development. It can help with their mental health and their physical development. There's loads of books, actually. I started the Sue Atkins Book Club in the pandemic to recommend great lesser known authors, actually, around all sorts of topics, because I think books can be a starting point for those big conversations with little people. And when I say that, it doesn't just have to be toddlers. That can be young kids as well and adults and teenagers. But reading bonding, connecting and sharing stories 
like my dad used to do with my with me and with my kids I loved hearing about his stories of growing up in Balham and during the war when a bomb dropped and the bus went into the into that and they had to go and sleep under under the tube station all these long stories the time he put his head out the train and everyone was worried about it and he got something in his eye look at those memories I remember all those years ago from my dad lying on the bed chatting sharing storytelling and making me laugh and I can remember them and then I remember that the wonderful feeling of tradition that he did the same with my children they know the same stories isn't that amazing and isn't that wonderful because it's a pleasurable activity as well as being good for kids it's actually good for you too you relax you bond with them it's good for your mental health you chill out as well as all those other wonderful things that we know that they enjoy nursery a bit more or they'll be more successful at school they'll be able to read the paper they'll be able to open a bank account all these practical things because they can read and they you know in fact there's studies to show as well that it reduces bad behavior in schools and expulsions and you know suspensions and things like that so the next part of what I was thinking about then, so what should dads read with their children? Well, for me, there are no rules here. Um, it's got to be something that you enjoy doing because your enthusiasm will come through. It's not necessarily reading the classics or reading certain books you think they should read. Because if you're not enjoying the story, they're not enjoying the story either. So if you're not a great reader yourself, don't beat yourself up. It's not about being a great reader, a confident reader, or doing those funny voices or any of that stuff. It's about fun. It's about laughter. It's about connection. It's about joy and making memories, I think, that last a lifetime with your kids. And it will also help them, of course, succeed in school. But as I said, don't worry if you can't do the silly voices. What actually matters is that you're helping your child understand what they're reading. Because when you read with your child, you can read to them, you can share a page, you, then they read a page, and then you read a chapter, or they read a chapter. But really, what they're gaining from all of that is a grasp of key concepts. You might be answering or asking them open-ended questions, not closed ones with yes or no. You're saying, what do you think he feels about that? You're talking to them about empathy. You may be saying, what do you think was going to happen next? That gets them curious. If it's the story that you've read over and over again, and a young child will enjoy, they giggle and they know what's coming next. It gives them familiarity. It gives them confidence. And even though you've probably, oh God, we've read this 25 times, just take in a breath and look at their faces for a minute and see the joy and the laughter when they know what's coming and they giggle with you and then they enjoy the story. Because you are helping them filter all this important information, all this knowledge through your perspective through your enjoyment of it. And that helps them take on new information and become a lifelong lover of books, maybe a lifelong learner, which I think is important. So one of the things I always felt I talked to parents about when I was teaching and we had parents evening, it's not really useful if you just read them on a Sunday for an hour or you listen to them read their book, their story, but you don't have to read when they've got their reading book, got to write in it. It's little and often is really important. So just that 10 minutes or that 15 minutes. And the other thing is think out of the box. It doesn't have to be at bedtime. It can be first thing in the morning if you're off to work. It can be if you're working from home, oh, I have a cup of tea at three o'clock. I'll sit and have a read with the little one and read a story with them. That becomes a memory, perhaps it becomes a habit, something they can look forward to, something you can really look forward to. So don't get fixated about, oh, I should do it at this time. Do it when it fits your family. And one thing I'd like you to get perhaps from today's little chat, if nothing else, is think Fred. Now, I've got a dog called Fred, actually called Freddy, but think Fred, because what it stands for is father reading every day. Because I think that gets you into a little habit and it will absolutely be something that you'll look back on and really thought, oh, I really enjoyed doing that, reading to the kids every day. Little and often was always my mantra as a deputy head. So lots of as we say, lots of dads are out and about, but if you put it into your intention and you make it a habit, that's why I always say when I work with clients one-to-one, -one, you know, what time will you do that? 
what day will you do that? And I get very specific. Because if you just say, it's a bit like you say, oh, we must meet for coffee. And you never really do, do you? Whereas you say, I'll see you on Wednesday at 11 here in this cafe. Then you will meet them. So it's the same thing for reading with your kids and storytelling. So encourage them. I mean, think, I remember reading with my kids Harry Potter. In fact, we as a family shared the books. In fact, I remember kind of fighting my son, Will. I thought, can I read it before you? And in the end, we had to get a couple of them. But the love of books, of those serial books, that joy of being read to, in fact, I really enjoyed. And I remember listening to Winnie the Pooh stories and poems when I was a little girl and my dad reading them to me. And I, you know, I just suddenly just jumped into my head. That memory was so enjoyable of Winnie the Pooh and just relaxing and laughing and listening. So the other thing I'd like to say is be guided by your kids interests don't necessarily better read this book this is meant to be good someone's recommended it if they've got an interest or they're a reluctant reader then find something that they do like to do I remember when I was actually trained to be a teacher Gabrielle Maunder there's a name from the past when she was teaching us she said don't embarrass an adult by saying here's a Janet and John book that that dates me she said go and get you know those manuals those guided books for motorbikes if the person is interested in the motorbike because they'll recognize Carburetta or break or whatever it might be so start from where your children's interests are they may be interested in baking cooking gardening science eco things plastic recycling whatever it might be there's loads of little books out there that you can just start with and get an interest in and dip in and out of and have make your home a place where books are naturally all around the place so that they can just pick up a book and look at the pictures if they can't read it themselves so also thing I, it brought back memories when I was doing this I remember we had this huge Reader's Digest atlas and I remember just pouring over it and and spending time just looking at all sorts of things and then my dad used to come in and he'd explain things to me at the back and what that meant and what that river was and all that because it doesn't have to be fiction it can be non-fiction which is really lovely as well for kids to get stuck into now let me have another look at my notes father serves important reading models as I said before, especially for boys. So when they are only young, they see perhaps they're at home with mum, mum is reading to them, then they go to nursery and they're usually surrounded by women who are reading to them. Then they go to school and a lot of primary school teachers, myself included, are women, although it's changing. And then you go to secondary and it tends to have more men in it. So of course, to some boys, reading is kind of a feminine thing to do. Not, it's not cool and it's not what, you know, it's not what guys do. So you know, it's important that they watch you and notice that you are reading. And so they get rid of that negative belief that it's for wusses or something that reading is that. So you can be broadening what they're reading. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be traditional fiction books. It can be newspapers. It can be reading instructions. It can be reading cookery books, reading for information. It can be Googling on your phone, sports stuff, anything like that that you're interested in. Bring your kids in, girls and boys, and get stuck in and get them reading. Could be even now we've got the World Cup coming up, whatever your views about that. Um, but we've got this, you know, the thing up with all the who's playing who, and you could get them talking, reading, looking, who's playing who. Do you want to talk about, um, you know, give me a paragraph about that game? What did you think of it? Let's write something down. Should we create a blog? There's all sorts of things you can do around reading, around the football things, which could be helpful. So now I thought I'd go on to a few things and a few ways that reading and storytelling matters. I've said it sort of before, but I want to reiterate it again. Reading improves your parent relationship with your child, parent-child relationship. All academic studies show that, you know, if you start to read to your children in infancy, that will really promote literacy. And as I always say, children spell love T-I-M-E. So reading with them, storytelling, laughing with them, joking with them, all of that oracy is, is really important because it bonds you together and you're nurturing their self-esteem because you want to spend time with them. And half the time, it doesn't matter what you actually do with them, but you stop what you're doing. You're not looking at your phone. You're not distracted by something. You're spending time with them. And that is really great for their self-esteem. And all the stuff I write about and broadcast and written about is all actually underneath it about a child that grows up with strong self-esteem. 
Reading improves their concentration. Children learn to concentrate and they can get a little bit more disciplined when they're being read to. If they're toddlers, and I was working with a client a couple of weeks ago, you build it up slowly. You know, the little fellow was running all around the place. He didn't want to sort of sit down and listen to a story, but you build it up. So you just do a short and that's you add a minute to it perhaps and then you notice another minute and then their concentration and, and all of that sort of thing develops as well and keep the stories perhaps simple when they're little like that and don't give up too soon with them keep on doing it you're creating an enjoyable environment you really want them to learn to listen and enjoy stories so when they do start school they can hit the ground running really we know that it builds neuro pathways within the brain it's sort of an exercise for the brain for me also i read avidly still it's a form of relaxation and i got more and more into it during the pandemic because i did my concentration was going a bit because I was always on my phone with Twitter or social media or on Facebook. Um, and I noticed mm, I'm not concentrating. I, I need to get a book, and get my teeth stuck into it so that I can actually build up my concentration again. So that's a, why reading matters as well with your kids so that they build up that balance. I never ban anything, but it's a balance between technology, social media, doing real reading, listening to stories, listening to music find that balance with them I think it's important um the, um, the life, where am I page five okay so we're going to this one uh reading can make your child more empathetic I think that's really important too because if you read stories where you can a, a character is having a tough time or going through a friendship issue or being bullied or has lost a friend or has lost a loved one reading stories can help you start difficult conversations sometimes it's a a sounding board and it's not so intense you're reading the story you talk about the character and say why do you think the badger feels so sad there's a very famous story about badger losing a loved one and you can introduce that if you want to around any subject and I think it's a lovely way to get children talking around their emotions and how they feel and with dads that's so great because we need dads to talk about their emotions too and not you know pretend they don't exist or it's not macho enough to talk about it. it's so much better for everyone's mental health if we learn to talk about all our different feelings reading of course encourages creativity and it can really ignite their imagination opening up their their world to new and different things different worlds like narnia or whatever it is that they're reading so keep them readily available for them so that they can you know sometimes you can just slip in a more when they're trying to story to them and then get them off out at the door and into the car. Um, as I've said before, they will have favourites and go with it. I always remember the Michael Rose, we're going on a bear hunt. Even to this day, I can still say swishy, swashy, swishy, swashy. You know, my kids absolutely loved it growing up. So you building up the, you know, all that wonderful memory and stuff. Um, you can also share book reading, perhaps you read to the kids one night, mum reads to one or other of them the next night. So you share, you've got different uh, contributions, different ways of reading, different things you ask. So that's great. So share the burden of all of that. So get, you know, share it with your partner if you have one and enjoy it. If you're a dad and you're, you're divorced or anything, you can read a story through Zoom. You can do all sorts of connection with your your phone like we're doing it here I'm chatting away to you on my own how amazing is that uh, so you could read a story or read nursery rhymes or sing a song or something like that with them so that is the bond you know um, if you don't see your child every day that's what I say try and do it regularly with them because respond to your easier and how about making up your own stories? You know, just relax. No one can hear you. Huh? You know, you're just there with your child. So make up a story. And it doesn't, I used to, my dad used to fall asleep sometimes in the middle of one. And the next day he'd start somewhere else. And I would then remind him what he'd said. Because clearly he'd made it up and he couldn't remember. But I did. So we started from that point. It doesn't matter. It's memories that you're building with your kids. And so that's important. As I say, think about your own life. Can you pass on some wisdom or can you just pass on a story that goes down through your generations about your dad or your mum or your grandma? Funny stories from your past, something like that. Um, you know, when you're out and about, um, look at billboards. 
Uh, so you help them read. You can read billboards. You can read adverts. You can read. I tell you one really great tip, and even Stephen Fry's uh, voiced over this one, to help them read when you're watching the telly and they're watching some of their programs. If you put up the subtitles, there's studies that show reading goes through the roof because they just by osmosis almost are listening, reading alongside it. So that's another really brilliant way to help your children with reading and literacy too. So if you play a board game with them, they've got to read the instructions, pretend you don't remember how to play. Can you read it? If you're cooking or you're in a restaurant, oh, can you, let's read the menu together, shall we? All these very simple ways will bond you with your kids to help them become lifelong lovers of reading. Uh, ask open-ended questions, but I've said before, have magazines around the house as well. Let them tear out pictures or cut out letters or whatever you want. But the next time you're tempted to skip reading to your kids at bedtime, as you're too tired, and they say, again, again, because they want the same book again, pause to ponder just how important it is. And you'll be really glad that you did. Thank you. That's me. Any questions? <laughs> well, I don't really know where to go with that. That was amazing. Absolutely amazing. Even better than I thought it was going to be. I don't mean to sound rude. But that, <laughs> I just, yeah, I've got so many questions. I don't even know where to start. But what, what I did do, and I think everybody here probably feels the same, is that I... I've seen things, and, and as you've described it, I've seen it in my children, and I've seen certain things I didn't even realise that we were doing. It was just maybe organically. Like you said, one of my boys, and it's something that comes up all the time, is if maybe their difficulty reading and dyslexia comes up quite a lot. One of my boys is extremely dyslexic, and what we found to help him was his mum makes candles and wax melts and stuff, and you described it perfectly, the, the ingredients. Yeah. You know, to be able to go on Google and find different scents. And it was just amazing to see that all of a sudden then that, that resistant was, I'm not saying that he became an avid reader overnight, but he wasn't so scared. He wasn't so scared to try. And that's what it, it gave him the confidence. And But the subtitles, I think it's been put in the comments about twice. That's a fantastic idea. I never, ever thought of putting the subtitles yeah. on. Yeah. So that is brilliant. Oh, no. That is really helpful for kids too. And yeah, with dyslexic kids, you know, the, the difference is that it's not, anything to do with not being clever and we all have to make sure they really know that that you know give them plenty of time and support they can get there you know and it doesn't hold you back and I, I on my blog I had a whole host of different people who were dyslexic who are dyslexic and it doesn't hold them back at all in fact they think out of the box in a different way but you know perhaps books as you say you've got to look at different ways of bringing those things in that don't sort of make them feel a failure Oh, honestly, that we, we've we've spoke quite a few times on online, and we had a really long chat, and you kept all of those to yourself because that was all new information to me. We never really discussed any of those tips before, so I'll be making notes. So I've got some stuff I'm going to do with my kids. So what we'll do? Well, I, I, if you want, I said to you earlier, Scott. If anybody wants my notes, um, I'll send them to you tomorrow, and if they're helpful to anybody, um, I'll, you know, here they all are, and uh, we'll send them across. Okay, then before, I was going to leave the questions, but there's one here that I think we'll address before we go to Diane, and then we'll just have to try and find time at the end for any more questions. But any advice for children with autism <clears throat> in terms of getting them involved in reading? Can you say that again? I didn't hear you. Sorry, any advice for children with autism in terms of getting oh, right. them to start reading? That's one of the questions. Well, yeah, in my book club, right, there's this wonderful author, and her name's Nikki Saunders, and you can Google her anyway. They're on Amazon, her books. Um, it is... Eddie, she calls them the Eddie series. They, they're written for her child who's got autism. And it's about explaining what autism is, but the books are so lovely and colorful and they're specifically written with autistic children in mind, not just because you want to talk about autism, but it is a wonderful introduction. She's also got some more books in that series around my friend, um, somebody, I think it's my friend Eddie, I don't know, um, who's got autism. So that children who don't have autism can learn and listen and grow from you know understanding what it means with a child with autism you've got to be led by them and the, the milestones and the steps always are personal to them 
don't keep comparing, and this is generally whether you've got autism or dyslexia, don't compare to other people. Just look at your own milestones for them and celebrate them as they go through. It's all about encouragement and enthusiasm and helping children overcome things. So if your child is autistic and they don't want to sit still for a long period of time, look at other ways that you can engage with them around storytelling. They might like to listen uh, if it's not too loud, it depends on their sensory in inload, but they can listen. Audible is wonderful. Spotify is marvellous. All sorts of ways that you, and you don't leave them on their own on the phone doing that stuff. Do it alongside them so that you are sharing the experience and go and be led by them. I hope that helps a little bit. No, oh, that's brilliant. That's brilliant advice. So are you going to be hanging around till the end, Sue, if anyone's got any oh, questions? Of course. Okay. Oh, yeah, of course. Thank you very much. You really appreciate that. So then... Diane, so then, yeah, again, um, Diane's going to talk. Diane and I met through Fathers Network Scotland, and we had a long chat about our love of sort of education. Um, I home educate my children, so it was something that we talked about, the ways in which we can entice them into learning. And what I found from Diane, apart from the fact that she's a project manager for people, and she works in Scotland, but you've also got a master's in early years language development. Is that right? Yeah. And yeah. I think it was yeah, just trying to find different ways in which we've seen it. You live in Yorkshire, you said you like to get out and about and walk around Yorkshire. So I won't introduce too much more. You're going to try and share your screen and then you can take it away, Dan, if you don't mind. Yeah, I'm going to give it a go. So, yeah. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me along tonight. Really pleased to be here because, like Scott says, this is something that I feel particularly passionate about. I'm probably actually, Sue, great minds think alike. I'm probably going to echo a lot of what you've already said, but I don't think that's a bad thing because it's such an important message, isn't it? So, you know, you've got both of us telling you the same thing, then that's a good message to take away, isn't it? Right. I'm going to try and share my screen. Good old technology, eh? Hopefully it works. Right. That hold your breath moment, isn't it? <laughs> it really is, isn't it? Okay. Can we all see that? Well is that all okay? Excellent. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. So, Diane Campkin, I am a development manager for um, the charity People, development manager for Scotland. Um, prior to working for People, I was also an early years teacher, so background in teaching, again, like Sue, and I was early years lead, so I had a long, long um, time working in early years. And I just realised at that point, it's so important, and the reason why I loved working in early years, you know, it really is the foundation of everything that happens afterwards for children. So we've got to get it right. Um, and whether that's within the school system or in a, in a homeschooling environment, as Scott does with his children, you know, we, we've got to make it our business to get this right. So came across people, became a freelance trainer on our Learning Together programme. And like I say, now I'm even more involved as a development manager. So supporting practitioners, who, um, who help parents to support their children's learning and development. So really exciting role. I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna start by talking about the power of 10. This is something that, that Sue mentioned, the power of 10. We, I always used to say this to parents when I was teaching, 10 minutes a day. That's what we're asking here, 10 minutes a day. And if I could tell you the sizable difference you could make to your child's life in 10 minutes a day, well, I'm gonna try and convince you all in a minute. But this was when I was on a mission to talk to parents about, everyone's busy, life is so busy, we completely get that, you know, really sympathetic to that. But 10 minutes a day is all it takes. It's 10 minutes, you can lose two hours scrolling through your phone, can't you, without even thinking about it. 10 minutes is a tiny, tiny proportion of that. So I'm gonna show you why 10 minutes a day is so, so important when you're helping your child's development, their learning, you know, their, their prospects, everything. So let me talk to you a little bit more about that. So the benefits of sharing stories with your child, you'll notice that I talk about sharing stories and I'm gonna explain a little bit more about that as we go along. But all of these things Sue's touched on already, so I won't spend ages on it, but improvement in vocabulary, but an extraordinary fact um, that I share on the next slide with you about that, but exposed in children to a huge range of vocabulary that they just simply wouldn't come across. Um, it really, this really struck me when I was teaching, had a, I had a, a young boy in my class, he was only four, and he had a toy lion. 
and he played with it and he sort of moved it along as if it was walking along the floor and he sort of looked at it a couple of times and then it, he did a barking noise like it was a dog and that little boy didn't know what a lion was he'd never seen it he was he'd never seen anything on television but he certainly had never come across a lion in a book that actually really shocked me and that was one of the reasons why um, when I did my master's degree I started looking at uh, looking at early language development and vocabulary for children because I found that really shocking that you could get to four years old and never be exposed to an image of a lion and understand what that is but he genuinely didn't know and obviously I, I gave him the word for lion but just by sharing books look you know what a difference that makes to a children's vocabulary and the knowledge building you know, another huge thing, isn't it? Again, you know, we, we've talked, Sue's already talked about this, but the construction of knowledge through um, through sharing stories and information and all of those different ways that you can share stories just helps a child to construct their knowledge of the world that they might not get otherwise. Bonding is absolutely crucial for mums and dads, but, you know, especially for dads who might not have as much quality time with their children, if, they, if they're the one that is working, um, they might have less time with their children, less quality time. So it's a really great way of um, having that very, very special bonding time. I think sharing stories can be a really effective part of a routine. And, um, you know, just, just for a child to know that this is what we do now but Sue's absolutely right we we do tend to just think about bedtime routines don't we oh it's bedtime story no stories are for any time of the day you know multiple times of the day so but they can form part of a routine that will just help a child to feel really sort of secure and they know what's coming next they feel comfortable they feel happy um you know so storytelling can be an integral part of routines Obviously, the teacher in me is going to talk about development of early literacy skills, of course. Um, I don't believe for a moment that that's what um, childhood education is all about. Of course not. You know, we need to take a holistic view of the child and think about their development in all areas. But there is no doubt, you know, and I am speaking with my teacher hat on now, that that sharing of um, stories really does help to develop literacy skills, rhyme, rhythm, intonation, tone, all of those things, the vocabulary that we've already talked about. They're just a few things just straight off the top of my head, but they really do feed into those early literacy skills and again that improvement of concentration and, and active listening then life that's life skills you know we're talking about there not just talking about oh I'm pleased as a teacher that your child can sit still on the carpet no forget about that these are really really important life skills and if you're sharing a story with your child and it's a story that they're familiar with or that they begin to learn you know and that there might be repeated refrains you know um run run fast as you can can't catch me I'm the gingerbread man but if every time you get into the that part of the story your child's joining in with that then you know that they are actively listening to the story so that's a really great um, skill that you can develop be their imagination and their creativity you know absolutely undoubtedly we know as adults the joy of escaping into a book and feeding our own imaginations what a wonderful thing we can share with our children and then enhancing self-esteem. And I, and I think, again, a lot, of, a lot of time parents don't realise all of the things that come alongside reading. If you're a dad and you've been at work all day, you come in and you read with your child, you're really showing them, you're putting aside that time for them, you're showing them that, that you are... Um, that they are very important to you and you know that helps to build their self-esteem doesn't it that that really special time so so many different things you know we can think of lots more Sue's covered many many things as well but there's some of the benefits of sharing stories with your child I used to always share this with parents 10 minutes and look what you can achieve just one 10 minutes a day I mean that that's just huge isn't it and a bit of the research and, you know, like Sue as well, don't, don't want to get too sort of top heavy with this, but I think there's so many interesting things here. Correlations between reading for pleasure and higher academic achievements in every subject, not just English. OK, that's my teacher hat again. But, you know, we want our children to do well, don't we? It's not all about that. Absolutely not. Um, but also reading for pleasure is actually more important for children's cognitive development than their parents of level of education. 
and is more powerful as socioeconomic backgrounds. So, you know, these are things that sometimes we really worry at worry about as parents we can't give our children this advantage or that advantage but actually reading for pleasure and teaching them and, and supporting them to read for pleasure facilitating that that's even more important than other things that we might not have the um, ability to do much about I think this this one this was the word thing that I, I mentioned uh, Children who are regularly read to in the first five years of life are exposed to 1.4 million more words millions we're talking in the millions how on earth anybody ever counts that and, and works that out for sure i don't know and you see all sorts of different things we talk about six million word gaps and things like that but you know 1.4 million words that's absolutely huge and even if it was 10 percent of that that would still be a lot of extra words that a child who's who has stories shared shared with them would get a big advantage that isn't it and then, you know, as we've been saying, the higher levels of self-esteem, um, and that's every, all of us who read for pleasure. So if we can really get that right for our children, right from the get-go, and really encourage them to have a love of reading, then that leads on to high levels of self-esteem and that greater ability to cope with difficult situations. Who wouldn't want that for our, child, for our children? Of course we would. And, you know, the good one that I wear is like to share with parents as well and reading for pleasure is associated with better sleep patterns as parents that's often um that's quite a good sway that one so yeah really really interesting there's a mountain of research out there that you can find for sure but just some just some little different areas there that i thought you might find interesting now i'm going to tell you a little story um, once upon a time, there was a very hard working man who um, spent a long time at work and doing overtime at weekends and things like that. But the one thing that he did do, and he was always very keen to do, when he got in from a long day labouring on a building site, he'd come in and he would read the bedtime story to his two little girls. And he did that, you know, pretty much as, as, as often as he could. Most nights he'd come in. And this was the book that they read together. Little, um, lovely little book, many different stories within that book. And I'm just sharing this story because that man was my husband and those two little girls are now 20. And oh, in fact, the eldest is 23 today. And if you ask them, their favourite book growing up. And believe me, they had loads of books there because I'm, I love reading and I really wanted them to have a love for reading. But if you ask them their favourite story from when they were little, it's always the Foxwood Treasury. And I've moved house several times and I have to bring that book. I'm never allowed to give that away. That comes with us to every new house because my girls, you know, one day we're gonna, we, we're gonna share this with our children and things like that. So they really love that book. You know, it didn't matter that I read lots of books. I was very privileged to be able to stay at home with them when they were little. And, you know, I, I read all sorts of things and shared lots of stories, but that is the one that really sticks in their memory because they just remembered daddy coming home from work and that really really special time that he had with them so just wanted to share that story with you and the other thing that goes alongside that story is my husband is extremely dyslexic so profoundly dyslexic um, diagnosed and everything for him reading was really tough you know and actually I'm so proud of him that he used to do that I was a natural reader and I could read stories out loud and make stories up and things like that. Much more challenging for him. You know, reading aloud, you'll know anybody who has dyslexia or is aware of it, reading aloud is the most tricky thing. And every night he sat and read those that story, you know, stories from that book to our girls. They didn't care. They didn't care that he didn't have the best kind of um, reading skills going they didn't care at all and actually later on when our youngest turned out she was dyslexic too it was absolutely brilliant that she had that role model you know that she she knew by that point her dad was dyslexic as well but he'd shared those stories with her and that was really really special but it's one of the reasons why I never ever say and I never used to say to parents read to your children don't, I didn't use that term, read to your children, because parents, not every parent can read 
And that's fine. That's just what happens, isn't it? So what I always used to say was, please share stories. And as Sue has illustrated so brilliantly earlier on, there's so many different ways that you can read stories. And if this is one message that I would really want to get across and for people to take away, anybody can share a story with their child, any dad, regardless of any kind of literacy levels or you know any kind of barriers like that to share stories. Pick up a book by all means. Oh, the feel of a book in your hands is just great, isn't it? So pick up a book. But you know, if you're you can read the words by all means, but also there are many picture books for little children, um, obviously. So you can pick up books and make up your own stories, follow the pictures, um, you know, share a story with your child in that way. You might also retell familiar stories. Um, I, the thing that I really remember from my childhood, um, my dad was great, he could read very well, you know, again, shared his sort of passion for reading with me. But on a Saturday afternoon, must have been like mum's um, afternoon out to pop off shopping after she'd been at home with us all week. And um, we used to sit down with dad, we would have the football results would be churning out in the background and the old biddy printer, for those of you who are old enough to remember that. But he'd get the Lego out. And bless him, he's not really a master builder, my dad. And the thing that we always laugh about when my sister and I talk about this a lot, because he would build lovely houses and the roof would never meet up and the roof would get bigger and bigger and bigger and it still would never meet up. And I think to sort of compensate for his lack of building skills, he then used to tell us stories. So he'd use that house and it might have been Hansel and Gretel's house or he might be telling us about um, Cinderella. He might have just made up his own story, but he'd use that, that, those Lego buildings with, uh, with no roofs to, to tell us familiar stories. And I really remember that, you know, I, I remember lots of great things from my childhood, but when I think about story time, that's what I think of, the Lego houses with no roofs, but those beautifully made up stories. He was great at that. Adapting familiar stories, you know, again, uh, as Sue says, we've all been there, I think, as parents, it's like, oh, I've got to read that book again for the 89th time, I'm really fed up of it now. Adapt it, you know, make it different, make it exciting for your children. What if Cinderella's slipper did not fit Cinderella? What if the ugly sister tried it on first? It was a perfect match for her, then what might have happened? What if the next time when you when you, what about the tiger who came to tea what about if he did come back again it always says at the end they bought him the tiger food but he never came back what if he did you know adapt those familiar stories take your child off on the journey that way you don't need a book you don't need any literacy levels to do that of course making up your own stories again something sue talked about we are all storytellers i've been telling you stories tonight Sue's been telling you stories tonight you'll no doubt in your mind got lots of your own stories as we've been talking we are all storytellers that's how we communicate so actually making up stories yeah have the confidence to do that you know Can't include your children in them children love to be having the central role in stories can be anything just something really simple don't have to be long complex stories co-create them together with your child and again, something else you mentioned, the fiction and non-fiction, you know, absolutely read and look at everything and share everything. So if you're in a cafe together, we have, have a look at the menu together, you know, um, and again, you've got pictures on there, so you can be talking about that as well. But, but sharing, there's so many different ways of, um, of sharing, not just fictional stories, but also sharing um, non-fiction information. And, you know, actually seeing some of my examples that I was going to say, but sort of instructions for things and menus, all of those sorts of things. There's, there's, there's reading material absolutely everywhere that you can share. Shout out for songs and nursery rhymes because they're just, they're so, so important. And again, as an early years teacher, you could see a mile off children who'd had exposure to songs and nursery rhymes. And sometimes, you know, if you, if you didn't have um, books and stories that you know from your own childhood, a really good starting point might be songs and nursery rhymes. Um, yeah, all of them tell stories, you know, there's Humpty Dumpty who was sitting on a wall and, and then, 
I just lost his balance and he's wibbling and wobbling and he ended up falling off and oh no see how easy that is to make that into a story um and obviously all of these nursery rhymes and things there's so many different places that you can find them online and so on so again if you don't feel very confident and you don't really have a big stock of nursery rhymes then um use resources online it's a bit of an elephant in the room isn't it we always used to say that actually Children, it's really great for them to hear stories that are read by different people. So obviously we really want to encourage dads to be in on the act, but it, it just a little sort of sideline as well. It doesn't harm to let children hear stories, sometimes, sometimes, you know, online stories because they're read by different people and that's fine as well. And again, you can get some really great male role models. Um, you won't be surprised to hear ladies amongst you that the favorite Jack and Ori story um, amongst the teachers that I work with were always the ones by Tom Hardy that probably won't be a surprise to many of you there so but again it's just another way of modeling so nursery rhymes really really powerful huge help with those early literacy skills um, and a really good and quick um, stories that you can tell from those nursery rhymes and it's never too early I think Scott mentioned this right at the beginning it really isn't we run an antenatal program as well at people and one of the big things um, one of the big themes in that is about talking to your bump but it's sharing stories and songs you know just very very simple just a few lines from a story you know there's that beautiful book for example guess how much I love you you know if you're reading a few lines of that your baby when they arrive will recognize your voice it's so powerful you cannot start sharing stories too early you know sharing a narrative with your child um, with, with a bump and everything oh we're going off to do this and that and so on all of that and, you know, a lot of parents, I've had parents that said to me, oh, they're, they're too little, they don't understand books. No, it doesn't matter. Start off from when they're absolutely tiny. You know, there's a wealth of different books around, um, board books and everything that you can share with your baby. Just get them used to having the feel of books around. And also, again, just verbally, orally sharing stories with them as well. It doesn't have to always be books. You know, you can um, be talking to them about things that have happened during the day, things that you're going to do, all of that. It really, really genuinely isn't ever too early to do that. So that's the end of mine. You can tell it's something that I'm very, very passionate about. Um, I think it can be very, very easy for people to think that it's a job of teachers or it's a job of mums. But no, dads have got a very significant part to play in sharing stories with children. And I really believe we're all storytellers and every dad can do that. So thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Diane. That was fantastic. Thank you. We have one question that I think was supposed to be in the chat, but it's come through directly. Um, and I think it obviously coincides with the story about your husband. And how can you get a reluctant dad who's embarrassed to read, to just try and read? Is there any tips or advice that we could give? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing is all of us as human beings, if we know there's a purpose behind it, then that's great so you don't what you what you want to do is come you know tell dad some of this stuff that I've shared it's well look do you know what a difference this would make and then they're really not going to mind I mean it's like singing I've got the most woeful singing voice children don't care the children in my class really didn't care that I was about as untuneful as, as I could possibly be they didn't care they just loved it so I think that's a really important message to convey firstly why it's so important this is not just mum saying I'm really tired I want to go and put my feet up for half an hour please can you read the bedtime story shouldn't be about that if they've got that understanding of the importance of it and how it can really really help their child that's a really great starting point and then just to remind them do you know what children are little they really don't care and feel free to share that story you know of my husband because genuinely i was the one that read to them and made it very expressive and exciting and all of that stuff that's the book that and that they're the stories that they most remember didn't matter that it was you know he was much more stuttery or anything like that so that's I think that's quite a powerful story to share as well I'm happy for anybody to do that no it's brilliant thank you Diane and I think just before I, I double check there's no more questions and um, I will ask Kathy to add a word in a minute but I just wanted to thank you both for coming and um, I am very grateful that you came you mentioned the fact about how important it is and how passionate you are, but 
it's something incredibly important to me um, and Cafe as well. I know as an organisation, this is something that we see is very important and it never is too early. And I think it's there is a little bit, particularly when we've worked with fathers, maybe even particularly younger fathers, sometimes that embarrassment of reading to a bump because you're reading to a baby that you can't really see. Um, and I know that's there sometimes and the nursery rhymes are all great. And, and, and I agree with that. And one thing, there's a lady on here today, Claire Blackburn, I'm going to embarrass her because me and Claire do antenatal classes together. Um, and this is something that we say is that nursery rhymes are fantastic, you know, and I think children love them. Um, and I think when we're trying, when baby's still in womb, it's trying to get used to the tones that you normally use and the voice that you use. And that brings in a point that you made and Sue made, especially the World Cup one now, you know, it's just using language that you normally use. Because what we see all too often, this is why this is really important, that when you work with dads antenatally, it's when they hold baby in the first few hours or even the first few days, um, that they don't know them, they don't recognize them, you know, it's like they're a stranger. And if they've created that relationship with the voice, you know, it just can make such a difference. And then some of the work that we do, which is away from what we're doing tonight, but sort of in terms of mental health and, and bonding with baby, that can start by that voice being something that they recognize. So it's not just reading. I think you're right. I think it is. It's storytelling. It's talking about your day. It's, it's reading what you're, even emails. You know, if you start doing emails, read it through the bump as if you're talking to your partner through the bump so they get used to the tones of your voice. So you can reassure them, particularly when we have babies that go to neonatal units. Because sometimes, me and Kathy have had this conversation quite a lot, that seven times out of 10, more often than not, anecdotally from my point of view, the dad or partner is the first parent in that in that instance, you know. So that first voice they might hear in that incubator, through the incubator, is going to be the other parent. So I think the sooner that we curate this, you know, so there is real benefits to not just waiting until you're trying to put them to bed to start reading, but, you know, starting a lot sooner. I think both of you have highlighted that incredibly well, and I am very grateful, um, and I really appreciate your time. So I'll open it up for any more questions. If nothing comes through, then I'll, I'll just pass over to Kathy quite quickly. Um, in fact, while I'm waiting for anybody to type, I'll just pass over to Kathy. I'll pass the book. Anything you want to add, Kathy? I'm just so grateful for um, both both of you, Sue and Diane, uh, taking time out of your evening to come and join us. I've really thoroughly enjoyed listening to you. 